If you have a Bible, you can open to Luke chapter 18 as we prepare to study God's word. Luke chapter 18. Once again, I want to welcome everybody here for the very first time. Can you just wave at me if this is your first time to love church? Just wave at me real quick. Anybody? First time right in the middle there. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Come on, let's give it up right over there. First time. For real? KB, you want to do me a favor real quick? Are you, do you happen to like Starbucks by any chance? Are you still, yeah? All right, what's your name? Maya? Maya? What's up, Maya? Everybody say, what's up, Maya? Yeah. All right, that's just a little gift, a little gift on God, a little cup of coffee for you. We love uh, welcoming people into our home. When we first started this church, it's what we used to do. We'd just gather in our, our basement around the Bible, a little coffee, hanging out, and uh, too many people started showing up, so we, we had to go rent out a middle school in 2008. Then we rented out a high school and then God built this. Um, it's so cool how he provides in every season. It's, it's good to be back. My name is Todd Doxon, if I haven't met you, by the way. Good to meet you, Maya. And one of the pastors here, we were out for a few weeks on sabbatical, recharging the batteries. And um, I just wanted to say a couple things as I get back into the pulpit. Number one, I love this church. And I just wanna say thank you to all of you guys that call this your home church. You serve, you give, you're in groups, you're going for it. Nothing cooler, one of the things that we get every morning, 6 a.m., uh, Self-Fed 365, and I'm, I'm hearing all of you guys get to know God one day in your own Bible, and it's just, that's why we started this church. Not so you can be spiritually swole and point fingers at people, but man, so you can experience God's best. So, super stoked. And then just the team here. Can we just give it up for all the volunteers behind the scenes, all the staff, all you guys, just an amazing team. And I love it, I love how, how he does it. God builds his church, it says his church, and he's inviting all of us into it to make a difference. As the days get darker and darker, the church, man, needs to step up, and all of us, man, we have a great opportunity. Uh, speaking of opportunity, Love Church North Omaha launches next Sunday. Come on, baby. Amazing opportunity. We had a, uh, a soft launch scheduled for this morning, but the power went out at the location that we're starting. And so where are my North Omaha people? Are they here, right here? You're right in the front row. My goodness, look at the launch team right here. You got stuck with us for one more week. I'm so sorry, but I'm so grateful for you guys, your faith, and that's the beauty of it, is all of us, opportunity to step up, make a difference. So grateful, each and every one of you. The block party happening Saturday, <laughs> I love it. I love the block party. Last year, I spent a lot of time playing hoops, which is my favorite sport. I just love simple things like that. And you might be like, hey, I haven't signed up for the block party. I don't know about all that. I'm a little uncomfortable in big crowds. I don't know what to do. Just sign up and just ask God to use you. Just to go, you know what, Here, you could be this. This could be your role on next Saturday. How many people, that's all they need right now is a smile. All they need is a little joy. That's, maybe that's all you bring to the table. Okay, okay. Bring that to the table. We're better together. Someone say, we're better together. Come on, let's do this together. All right, speaking of which, Luke 18, I'm gonna try something different today. I just wanna read our text today. And yes, I am wearing glasses. Studious, studious and seasoned. Let me read the text and then we'll get into it. All right, Luke chapter 18, verse nine. Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and then scorned everyone else. That person is kind of like, sorry, I had to do that. 
Verse 10, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, everybody say Pharisee. And the other was a despised tax collector. Two opposite spectrums of the spiritual hierarchy in that day. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. This is interesting. I thank you, God, that I'm not like the other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector right there. Not like that guy. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. Verse 13, but the tax collector, look at this guy. He stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. Verse 14, look what Jesus says. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. God, thank you for your word. And as we consider it for a few moments today, we pray, God, that you would grow us. I, I know I'm the chief of sinners. I need to grow in this area. And I pray all of us as a church in this season could be our greatest hour and so we pray just a spirit of humility would come across this church and the greater church in the city of Omaha and the nation. Trusting in your righteousness, your goodness. Having deep gratitude in our hearts and pray that you would teach us like never before by your spirit. I pray I'd get out of the way. You would speak to every single soul listening to my voice. You'd be glorified, we'd be changed, we'd grow closer to you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, what are some of the character qualities of the people you love and respect the most? Come on, you can send them to me. Any, any character qualities of the people you love and respect the most? Come on, give them to me, come on. Consistency, I like that, good. Integrity, good. What was that? Humble, good, come on. Mandy, go ahead. Patient, man, kind, oh. Honest. Joyful. I love that about you, by the way, Cap. Like, every time I'm around you, that's why I dress like you, just because of that. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, like, we literally came to church today and, I, and it's funny, because Cap and I have been talking about this. I'm like, yo, like, I can't like, get that same shirt. He's like, get the same shirt. We'll never actually wear it at the same time. I just get it this week. I show up. He's got the same shirt on. Yes. <laughs> oh, you got to love it. it. It's so weird as I continue to progress in life, as I continue to grow and mature in life, I would just tell you the number one character quality of the people that I'm, I'm respecting the most is humility. And I don't know what it is, I recognize it more. And probably because <laughs> I'm just hypersensitive to how prideful I am. And, and God in this season, he's just showing me more and more how, how, how I have how do I say this, like, I don't even see my pride sometimes. I have blind spots of pride, and God in his grace is just showing me more and more of that. Anybody been watching the Olympics, by the way? Anybody? <laughs> Dude, it's so interesting to me, the, these athletes, the best athletes in the world, and all these different events, I was watching a, a judo Thing. And there was this huge dude from France, just, just swole, just, and it was like his third championship. And I'm looking at the guy, I'm like, oh, goodness, get me out of here. It's like, but, and it's interesting because you see some athletes and they'll win a gold and you'll just see their reaction. 
And some of them are just like, just so, like they're the best in the world. And they're like, man, I'm just so grateful for, for how God made me and gave me the ability and the grace to work hard. And you see just, just hum, everybody say humility. It just, it just oozes out of them. And I'm like, I wanna be like that guy. And then there's a lot of us, we're on the couch eating potato chips and you'll look over to your wife and you'll be like, I could do that. <laughs> Come on, how many of y'all actually did that? That, that, that looks easy. I could, I, could, I could probably do that. I just, I just don't want to. You know, I just, I'm good. I'm good with everything. What is it about us as humans that we're pre-programmed with this pride problem and we, we work it out? I, I've noticed that humility often is connected to identity and, and security. The more I know who I am in Christ, the more I grow in humility. I'm not needy to be known, and I'm not needy to tell you how awesome I am, because I already know in Christ who I am. And so it's all connected. So many of us grow up insecure, a variety of different reasons, and it comes out in pride. And that's what we're gonna see today in our text. We're gonna see a stark contrast, as we just read, and as you read this week, how many are just reading with us every single day in the word of God or even a good majority of the day? See, and again, you're not raising your hand like, yeah, I'm awesome, I'm spiritual. What, what you're raising your hand is you're taking a challenge so you can grow in your identity in Christ so you can grow by God's spirit in humility. So you read it this week. Jesus is constantly having this ongoing conversation with the religious elite at the time, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, these big daddies. They, they, were, the, they were the top echelon. And man, they, they stuck on to you know, the, the law and every little thing, which by the way, praise God, do the right thing, it's great. But the problem was they were holding on to what they did to make them right with God. And we do the same thing today, don't we? As, as, as good religious Christian people, I, you know what? I had a good week. I paid my tithe. I opened up the doors for, for old ladies. Um, I read my Bible every single day. I had my quiet time for an hour and a half. You slacker only had about five minutes, man, but I had a long time. So, so he's having this ongoing conversation and he talks with them. And then there was this group, the, the tax collectors, and they would be the bottom echelon. Why? Well, the, the, the tax collector in that day, they were number one enemy of the Jews because they were working with the Roman government to take, collect taxes, and many times they would collect more than the Romans actually needed, so they'd pad their pockets by jacking their own people. So, so you have like these, you know, this, this religious elite coming to the, to, to church to pray, and then you have this, this despised tax collector. And Jesus is using this story to challenge not just the Pharisees, by the way, but to challenge me, to challenge you. What blind spots do you have, do I have today, in how awesome I am as a Christian and how much of a slacker, sinner that person is over there? And I'm telling you now, right now, in our culture today, one of the greatest needs we have in the nation today, in the divisive and chaotic world we live in, is humility. And if we, I'm telling you, if, <laughs> if it is like, if this is us as Love Church, or the church in general, I'm telling you, man, we just gotta repent right now. I repent. I repent, I repent of, of ever judging someone else. Listen, it's only by the grace of God I am who I am, I'm where, where I'm at today. And the same thing with you. You know, you had a deep revelation of who, what God did in your life and now you can actually walk in freedom. It's not you just woke up and were like, yeah, I'm pretty sweet and I'm gonna work my way into that. It's not that at all. So let's just break it down a little bit. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. A working definition of humility that I really like, check this out, is not thinking less of yourself, 
but thinking of yourself less. Oh, I like that. Because it's not demeaning of yourself. God created you in a certain way. He's given you a certain gifts to steward, to maximize. Let's send it. But man, if I'm thinking of others way more often than I am thinking of myself, man, I'm gonna be walking in humility. Such a, such a great definition. Okay. Verse nine, again, check this out. Then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own, there it is, underline that, in your own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Do you know these type of people? You ever been this type of person? Uh, I'll just tell you, this happened to me recently. I came into this home and there was someone that was staying there for nine days and the place was basically brand new nine days before, perfectly clean. I walked into this place, and it looked like a bomb went off. We're talking Cheerios, crumbs, stains in the couches, stains in, in the kitchen chairs. I mean, it was just, I was like, and my first reaction was like, what kind of animal actually lives like this? And I'm like, who, who does this? I'm, I'm just trying to be honest with you as, as your pastor, right? What was, what was happening right there? Pride. I'm, I'm, I'm puffing out my chest on how awesome I am because I'm so clean. I steward everything really well. And who's this slacker right here that was in this home for nine days and just made an absolute mess of the place? that my wife and I had to spend five hours cleaning it before we left the place. You ever been there? It was so convicting because I'm reading this text and God's like, hey, because I named this guy, the Pharisee, I named him Puffy, by the way. Because you know what pride does? The Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm puffy pastor judging someone, and here's, here's what came to my mind, okay? You guys ready for it? And hopefully this helps you out because it's helping me grow. It's not, I don't want you to feel like judged and beat down because that's the, beat the whole point, but I want some, some spirit conviction that he's doing in my heart. Hopefully it does it in yours as well. Here's what he started speaking to me. He said, Todd, did you um, choose where you're gonna be born? I'm like, no, I had nothing to do with that. Um, you were born, and your mom, Lois Kendall, that I just sovereignly made her your, your mom. And she was raised by a family that was very good at a cleanliness and stewardship and hard work and discipline. And she made you, you, you wouldn't have chose it, on Saturday, you had to clean the entire basement and everything perfect before you could go play sports. You didn't choose that. She made you do that. I wasn't gonna do that. I'd had Cheerios all over the floor, stains in the couch and everything. But by God's grace alone, he sovereignly placed an amazing mom in my life that made me do it, that built the discipline in my life, and now you come over to my house and now it's clean. And then, and then God's like, how do you know what happened in their life? Maybe they just never were trained on how to be a good steward. Maybe they came from a, a, a background where they had no choice and it was just fend for yourself and just survive. <laughs> Guess what happened with Puffy Pastor? <laughs> and I could go a variety of ways. It was, it was crazy. I, <laughs> I took uh, some kids KB and I did to the Kansas City Chiefs camp and one of the little boys we took is one of our pastor's kids and we stopped at a restaurant and we went in, we both had to go to the bathroom, we went into the bathroom and it was so cool because after we went to the bathroom, you know when you wash your hands and then you take the paper towel and you dry your hands? Here's a question, what do you do? Do you look around to see if there's other pieces of paper on the ground 
Or do you just go, I don't care, that's the janitor's problem, I'm gonna keep on going. It's funny because his dad trained him. And he looks at the ground and he's like, we always leave a place better than we first came to it. I'm like, uh, he's like, yeah, I learned that from my daddy. How many kids don't have a daddy to teach them that? And then we're gonna judge them for what their eyes haven't opened, been opened to the daddy that's given them the grace to prepare them for that, that time? I was like, okay! I, I couldn't get away from this word confidence too. He had great confidence in his own righteousness. His own righteousness. And then he looked down on everyone else. The confidence in Here's a question, what's your confidence in? What's my confidence in? <laughs> He's, Jesus is making a very clear distinction for the religious elite and really all of us at the same time. He's saying, listen, it's not about self-righteousness. It's not about what you can do. Did you know, it's, it's, it's about what Christ has done. Those are two different things. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What is it? It's a great exchange. When I come to Christ, I bring him all my junk and my sin and my failures and my flaws and my fumbles, and guess what I get? I get his perfect life in exchange. So now when I'm walking through life, I'm not puffed up in my own pride. I'm like, oh my goodness, God, you gave me everything. You gave me your perfect life. It's righteousness by faith in Christ. That's it. Boy, that is freeing right there. That's the gospel. It's not like I do, do, do. I gotta earn my way to heaven. It is, man, I'm, I'm, I'm resting in Christ and I'm confident in Christ. It's savior righteousness, not self-righteousness. Those are two different things. And I'm telling you, it's hard. It's hard. Why? Because we live in a performance culture. I grew up in athletics and everything was judged. Every rep, and then as you progress, you'd go to college and after practice, you'd go into the film room and every little play was judged. It was evaluated, it was your performance. How many, you have a performance review at work, which by the way, it's good, because some of us, we need to up our game a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. But now we take this performance review into our faith, and now we're striving to earn points. I wanna get a good grade with God. And that's what this Pharisee was doing. He's like, I have confidence in my own righteousness, and then not only do I have confidence in my own righteousness, but then I compare with others, and I'm looking down on others when they don't do it as good as I do which is a great problem to have. Verse 10, I can't even get past the first verse. I'm sorry, y'all. It's what happens when you go on sabbatical and you, you like, dude, cool down. Everybody say, cool down. Cool down, pastor. Cool down, bro. You got the cool shirt with pastor cap. Just cool down, man. Just cool down, brother. <laughs> Settle down. Verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. And just picture it, so the way they would approach God, there was a temple, there was certain sections of the temple. There was like the outer court where kind of some of the general public could be. Then there was like, a, like an inner court if you were kind of like a priest. And, and so I'm just picturing this Pharisee, this guy that was like, you know, pastor, priest, like big time guy, and he's kind of walking in to pray with a pompous, puffy kind of attitude, and then this other guy, this, this, this tax collector that everybody hated, I'm picturing him coming into church kind of like, oh man. And I see that, man, in the church, I see some guys like, like, yeah, let's celebrate the Lord, brother, I'm awesome, you know, and then you see some people like, oh dude, it's is fire gonna come down like and burn the church if I enter it, right? I, I see kind of like, and I see that, that happening right here, both of them. 
in the next chapter, actually, there was uh, the chief tax collector, like the CEO of H&R Block, Zacchaeus. You remember that story? <laughs> and he's a short little fella, and he knew Jesus was coming by, hops up in the tree. Don't you love that? And Jesus is like, yo, Zacchaeus, calls him by name, by the way. He's like, yo, come down, and he just invites him over for dinner. I love that kind of stuff. Jesus is looking for you. He's like, yo, I wanna come to your house. I don't care how despised you think you are. I wanna come to your house and change your life. And this is the most despised guy around. Let's look at, and you can jot it down. So I forgot to give you a point. Number one was confidence. Number two is cocky. My wife wanted conceited. I stayed with cocky. I'm sorry, that's the title of the message. Why is that? Because so many of us are cocky Christians, but we're actually burning bridges with the lost that need the love of Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ. We're burning bridges by pointing fingers. No, 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 we need humility in this season. Humility to build bridges with the lost, man. They just don't know. Jesus himself on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. When you're, when you're in-laws and your family and your friends and they're like completely disconnected, when you, when you go, oh, what's happening? You're like, oh! So, verse 11, I love it. The Pharisee stood by himself, here's the prayer, and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. How about that, by the way? Anybody just start your prayer like that? God, thanks so much and I'm awesome. <laughs> Remember when I mentioned blind spots? This guy's got a blind spot. I don't cheat. Watch the, and you see in his prayer, he mentions God once, and the rest of the time, he just starts talking about himself. I don't cheat. Talking about I don't do this. I don't cheat. I don't sin. What? I don't commit adultery. And then he, I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. What, what's interesting, I was studying this in another translation in the New King James. It actually says that he prayed with himself, which is so interesting because he was, he's acting like he's praying to God, but he's really just kind of talking to himself about how awesome he is. One of my favorite commentators, Jay Vernon McGee, old school, I love this cat. Anybody know Jay Vernon? That dude's got game. He said this, he said all, this guy, the Puffy the Pharisee, all he did was have a pep talk. He patted himself on the back and went out as proud as a peacock. <laughs> oh my goodness, and I was thinking about this. How, how do our prayers sound? You know, some of us, we, we, we say, and I've, I've, been, I've done this, I, I say I'm praying, but I'm actually preaching. You ever been there? God, thank you so much. Or, or <laughs> you're talking about someone else in your prayer. God, we just pray for, you know, so and so, you know, they... You know, I really am great with my money. That person just wastes everything. I, can we just pray for them now? <laughs> what? Well, we're just gonna come in, in prayer. They're addicted to, you know, I've never been addicted like this guy. This guy. Sometimes we don't even know what's coming out of our heart. We don't know the blind spot that we have. Matthew 12, 34, B, check this out, says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When I was bad-mouthing the person who stayed in that house for nine days and judging them, what was really happening? God was allowing me to see for myself what was already in my own heart. He loves me so much, he is wanting to expose the fruit that's in my heart that I don't even know I'm producing. 
And he's, he loves me so much. He's like, no, man, like, I want you to see people with, with eyes of destiny. I want you to see people like I see them. They, they, they grew up maybe and didn't see. They weren't exposed to the things that you were. They weren't trained like you were. Does that make you like cool and superior? No, it just means that you need to thank God and be more grateful for what he's already given you. Humble people, listen, they're full of gratitude. They understand the deep revelation of Christ and what he's done in our life. So we express this, this, this gratitude. There's an area lately that's been breaking my heart. And I'll just, I'll be honest. And we'll see this in the next couple months. And I'm just, I, all I'm trying to do is lead us as your pastor. If you look at me as your pastor, here's what I'm, try, here's what I'm trying to lovingly challenge and encourage us as a church as we head into determining who's gonna lead the free world. Here, here's all I'm asking, is that we, that we lovingly disagree and we have a deep conviction from God, but we don't point fingers or judge others as we do it. And I know this is gonna be tough. There, there was a guy um, recently, I heard him give, he gave a nine minute talk. And in the talk, one of my favorite statements he said, he said, we can disagree like, and I can't say the word he said, but then afterwards, we can go break bread and have a good meal together. He's like, that's the kind of country we need to get back here. I was like, ah, oh, yes, freedom. Free, you know, and what that, you know what that takes? It takes humility. Jesus, when he came, did you, if you, I gotta show you this text so you don't think that I just made this up. John 1, 14, can you show the church the text? I love it. John 1, 14, the word became flesh, talking about Jesus, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten the Father. What was, what was Jesus full of? Watch this, what was he full of, church? Nothing, okay. <laughs> he, the Bible says, I'll just fill it, he was filled with grace and, oh. he was filled with grace and, truth. oh, I love that. Here's what's happening right now, and we gotta repent as a church and as a, as a Christian community. We're coming with truth. Truth. No need for grace. But my Savior and your Savior, what did he come with? He came with grace and truth. Oh, I gotta teach it again. Grace and truth. Here's the thing. When I lead with humility and grace, I don't have to back down from the word of God and compromise the word one ounce. I can love and encourage. I could share what I believe to be true, which is the word of God. And even if you don't agree with me, I can still love you. I can pray for you and I can break bread and have a good meal with you. That's grace and truth. Some people want to just have grace, but no, they have no truth. That's called sloppy agape. That's like, believe whatever you want to believe, man, it's all good. You know, the book we're reading right now is Judges. Chapter, if you go to the very last verse in the book of Judges, it says this, check this out. They had no king, watch this, and they did what was ever right in their own eyes. That's called moral relativism. I am not suggesting that. I'm saying full of grace, but then standing strong in truth. That's how we move forward as a church, a global church, the right way. Why? Because Todd said it? No, because that's the way Jesus did it. In another text, the Bible says in John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You wanna win some, be winsome. You wanna just keep on dividing and giving Jesus a bad name, just keep on truth with no grace. Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay, my bad. I'll keep you all awake, it's a little hot in here. All right. So we got Puffy, the pastor, Puffy, the, which we've all been there, and we need to repent of. 
because our confidence is in what we do or don't do. Looking down on others, despising others. But then we make this shift. We move from, from cocky to contrite. Oh, it's beautiful. And listen, if you're a cocky Christian, there's hope for you. There's hope for me. He gives you another chance to move to humility, to move to have a contrite heart. Look at 13. This is a perfect picture. This is why he told the story right here. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance. I just picture the guy. It's some of you that just come into church and you're like way in the back. You're like, oh, I don't know, man. Will they accept me? I don't know, man. I, I, they don't know what I've done. That, this guy, this guy s- stands at a distance. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, oh God, be merciful. Look at that, underline that in your Bible. Be merciful to me, I am a sinner. In the original Greek, actually, it translates better as I am the sinner. This this dude, notice that that Puffy, the Pharisee, he's like, good thing I'm not like that idiot right here. I don't sin. Oh, man. This dude is acutely aware of where he's at as a sinner. One of the things that God does often with me as your pastor, if I start getting a little puffy, I have like maybe a couple weeks or a couple months, I'm in my word every day, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking pure thoughts, I'm treating my wife good, all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, man, I got this. And then right at the most opportune time, he'll just let me just fall on my face I'll, I'll, you know, I'll raise my voice I, in front of someone right to my wife. I'll demean. That's typically what happens by God's grace. Thank you, babe, for your mercy and your grace. And, and what do I do? I drop to my knee. God. Oh. Oh. Be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. I'm a, I am the sinner. The things I don't want to do, I, I, golly, I end up doing. The things that I want to do, I just don't do. Can you just forgive me? Be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. You know what mercy means? Not getting what I do deserve. (laughs) You know what I deserved many times from my wife? You idiot, you call yourself the pastor? Get off the stage, bro. Go sell cars or something. You'd be better at that. And you start talking to me like that again. But you know what, she, she engages in, in the spirit of God and is like, dude, forgive that dude. I'll be merciful. Can, can you give me your mercy so I can extend that mercy to this guy right here? Am I right? How many marriages would still be intact today if we could practice this humility, this mercy? The sinner. Paul the apostle, one of the, I mean, wrote, darn near two-thirds of the New Testament, he, he said, actually, that he was the chief of sinners. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Look at Isaiah 57, 15, so good. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Listen, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has what? Has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. There it is. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It's what God loves. He loves a broken, a contrite heart, someone who's in tune to their failings, to their inadequacies, to their fumbles, their foibles. Someone who doesn't, who, 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 who allows God to expose some of those places that we don't even see to allow us to grow forward, to, to ask for forgiveness. That wasn't honoring to God. That wasn't honoring to my wife. Will you forgive me? That's what he honors. And that's what he says here in verse 14 as we land the plane. I tell you, this sinner... <laughs> This despised tax collector, the one that everybody hated, this one who blew it bad, this one, not the Pharisee. So we got contrite the collector on his knees. 
Be merciful to me, God, I'm a sinner. He said, that dude, he went home justified before God. You know what justified, you know a great way to remember justified? Just as if I'd never sinned. He, he that guy, he went home justified before God. And here it is, just start this in your Bible. Take the next week and just underline this in your Bible and ask God by his grace to download a supernatural download of this right here. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, <laughs> and those who what? Humble themselves will be exalted. That's so good. Two choices. Humble ourselves, God can exalt. Get prideful and just wait. <laughs> He's gonna let us fall right on our face. You remember the perfect picture is the difference between Satan, Lucifer, who was an angel in heaven. Did you know that Satan originally, he, he, he's this beautiful angel in heaven, but his problem was he wanted to be exalted above God. I will be exalted above God. And the Bible says that he was sent low. Jesus, on the other hand, complete opposite. Jesus, the CEO of the universe, what did he do? He humbled himself. I gotta read this text, it's so good. Philippians 2, verse six. Check this out. Go back and study this, this is so good. Philippians 2 and six. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Puffy. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position as a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled, there it is, he humbled himself in obedience to God, died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Therefore, what, did, what happened? God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. <laughs> what a picture. So I would just say in summary, how do you and I, and maybe just let me ask you this question real quick. Who are you most like in these days, in this season of your life? Puffy? Puffy? Puffy the Pharisee? I'm pretty good. And you just have this, this knack where you're just finding all the flaws in everybody else and pointing your finger at them, okay? Just be honest with yourself. Or are you in this place of contrite, the collector, very aware of your inadequacies, very aware of your weakness at times, and your posture before God is humility? Where are you at? I would tell you this. The greatest way to go from puffy to contrite is stay connected to Jesus, why? Because he just showed you in Philippians 2. You and I, in our own strength, impossible, but as we stay connected to the vine, we stay filled with God's spirit, that is the only way to be able to stay in that position of humility, and that is gonna be the power position, and the key for us as Christians moving forward is humility, amen? God, thank you for this this word today, I needed it, and I'm grateful for it. I'm thankful, Jesus, that you love us enough to get up in our grill a little bit today and to invite us into something deeper, more profound. And you're using all kinds of things. You're using storms, circumstances, pressure, relational strain, financial strain, and we see it. You're using it all to expose some of the fruit, some of the pride, some of the arrogance, some of the blind spots that we have, but you're so gracious, you're so merciful, so we humble ourselves before you today. Refresh us, God, fill us with your spirit of, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, for your glory in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna just create an opportunity of response. There might be someone listening online or here in the auditorium and you go, man, I have been 
the person that's been doing my own thing. Stiff arming God, hard headed. I'll just kind of grin and bear it. Maybe you had a, a bad picture of who God was as you were growing up and you had just a hardened heart. Maybe this is for you. Maybe quite honestly, you've been noticing friends and family members kind of moving away from you and you're wondering why, could it be your puffy? And you need to kill the pride today, you come to Jesus. The Bible says that we just read, God is perfect, he's holy. All of us, we've broken his laws, we fumbled the rock. Because he loves us so much, he came to this planet, he lived the perfect life, he died the death in our place. Listen, the sin had to be judged but he loved us so much, he's like, I don't want them to have to pay for that, I'll do it. They buried him, three days later he rose from that grave and now he sends his spirit all over the world. He's just knocking on hearts. He's such a gentleman, don't you love how much of a gentleman he is? He's not gonna barge your door down, he's knocking. He's like, come on man, I got something better for you. Just come and humble yourself. I'll forgive you. I'll set you on a whole new destiny. Not just going to heaven when you die, but man, giving you the abundant life right now. And do you want that? Let's stand together because maybe there's a couple people you've come here for the first or second time and you've never, you're like, dang, man, I, I, I need in on this. I want a relationship with God. In a moment, the band's gonna play a song. There's gonna be a lot of Christians in the church here and listening online, they're praying for you. This is, this is serious business, man, this really is. That's why we encourage, if you don't absolutely have to go somewhere right now, we just invite you to just stay and pray. Just pray for the person right now. Stuck in pride, stuck in sin. There's something better for them, not judging them, inviting them to a whole new life. That's our prayer. So I've said enough. As the band plays, if this is your heart, you wanna humble yourself, you can come forward right to this platform. I'll lead you in a prayer. We'll connect you with the team. We'll, we'll give you a Bible and help you begin the journey. You come now. Church, begin to pray. You come now. You come now to the front. Come on. Come on down. Good move, man. Good move. Come on.